Hello, everybody, and welcome. Hello and welcome. I'm hanging out in the darkness here because uh, you don't need to look at my face today. You want to look at a new role-playing game. We're going to be taking a look at the Root RPG. It's the Root RPG. Now, I'm super, super excited because the very first thing that I did when I played Root, Root is a phenomenal board game, right? Root is this board game that I think is is mechanically like deeply interesting. It's an asymmetrical board game where you play tiny adorable animals and you fight each other and there's like factions and there's a cool map and the art and the setting are really cool and Root the board game does a thing that I love and I think I think there are other games that do this but Root the setting does the thing that I love where it's it's putting up in front of you Look at this cute beaver with a sword and and look at this look at this cardinal with a crossbow. It's great and cute and stuff, but if you look at the if you look at the layers, if you look at the fictional layers of this game, it's a war. There is a war going on and there's all the like dirty doings and the secret deals and the great faction stuff that for me really draws me into a into a game setting. So the board game I loved it from the get-go, right? Started playing it, I've played it a lot now and every time has been great um so it's a really fun game really great branding and design and i don't know if you do this i don't know if you do this but this is something that i do all the goddamn time if i watch a movie if i read a comic book if i play a video game or a board game i immediately start thinking hmm i wonder what this would be like as a role-playing game what could I do to play this as a role playing game? Now there are characters in the their factions and characters in the root game, the board game called vagabonds, who are basically individuals trying to thrive and survive inside this adorable woodland war. And I thought, you know what? It'd be super cool if you could play one of them in a role playing game. And so then Magpie, Magpie Games, reached out to me. Mark emailed me and said, Hey, Adam, we're making a Power by the Apocalypse root tabletop role-playing game. To which I said, Hooray! I'm so excited. Because, like, honestly, like, it's, it's very cool that I don't have to do all that work. I don't have to hack another system. I don't have to, like, clutch some stuff together. We get new art. It's a game made by a company that I know makes games well and has a good handle on Powered by the Apocalypse. And we get to take a look at it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start, as I often do, I'm going to start by letting the fine people of, uh, the fine people of Magpie Games tell you about their game. Um, now you can find out more and I hope that you will, you can find out more during the fundraising for the game. Uh, it's going to be fundraising, uh, for 32 days. It looks like starting today. Um, if you're watching this live, if you're watching this on YouTube, today is the 17th of September. So you probably still have time to go check it out. Go to bit.ly slash root first look all one word. And I'll take you right over there. And uh, it'll let uh, let Magpie know that I sent you. But I'm gonna let them explain their game to you. I'm gonna let them them promo it, and then we'll and then we'll take a good look at it ourselves. So here we go. Let's let's have a look. What's Root all about? Woodland. The Marquise de Cat and her armies clash with the Airy dynasties and their loyalists. Clearing after clearing faces the fires of battle. Amid the war, you and your friends arise. A band of vagabonds beholden to no power and capable of tipping the balance. Arbiters, rangers, scoundrels, thieves, tinkers, and vagrants, all rogues. Perhaps you will serve the woodland denizens, helping them through hard times. Perhaps you'll become bandits and raiders, taking goods and dignity from foes. Perhaps you'll take up arms and lead the woodland alliance into battle. Or perhaps you'll become valued lieutenants of the Eerie Dynasties. The choice of who you will become and what fate will befall the woodland is yours to make. Root the Tabletop Role-Playing Game is based on the same world as the award-winning Root A Game of Woodland Might and Right board game, released in 2018 by Leader Games. 
where the board game allowed you to take on the high-level role of the leadership of a faction, the tabletop role-playing game allows you to take on the role of individual characters, vagabonds. Root the tabletop role-playing game will give you all the tools and rules you need to play through the adventures of your own band of vagabonds as they reshape the woodland. Pick up your sword. Stand strong against your foes. The woodland needs you. Primo. Right? Gorgeous. So, it's a game of woodland adventure. That seems about seems about right. Uh, it's a game of woodland adventure. The the video there calls out specifically that there is uh there is the high level faction play and you know I love high level faction play and then you are playing vagabonds within that game, which is really cool because and I'm hoping this is what's going to make or break the game for me. I'm hoping that there are tools for doing a like faction turn to see if the Marquise de Cat or the the Eerie or the Woodland Alliance or the Lizard Cult, as you engage with them, like what are they doing? What's going on? How is the woodland changing? So let's let's dig into the game. We're gonna be looking at the quick start rules, uh, which are uh, available, I think, to everybody on drive through. Uh, this is this is the this is the cover here uh, of the quick start rules. We're gonna be looking through this. Uh, and then I think there are a few places in the quick start rules that explain to you kind of where more stuff will be filled in. And it looks like they're working on a supplement as well. Um, so Magpie Games, before we get into it, um, Magpie Games, I think that probably they are best known for, I'm going to guess amidst this community, they're best known for Masks. So Masks is uh, a game of te teenage superheroes. It is one of my favorite Powered by the Apocalypse games. Um Magpie has a really good handle as a design group on how to make the PBTA system do certain things. And so what for me is going to be interesting, and this is true of, of every licensed game, of which this is one, what about this game captures what things about the root board game, right? What, what stuff in this game makes me feel like the, uh, like the board game, right? What, what immerses me in the world uh, mechanically? So uh, the quick start rules, I think, come with five playbooks, which will take up a big chunk of it. And then we get our basic moves and some of the other stuff that the game goes into. I'm curious to see what they include and what they what they leave off. But the core premise of the world of the game is that there is a, a woodland realm, right? There's the woods and in the woods, there are clearings and the clearings are where the bunnies, mice, and foxes, they are the people that live in these woods. It's where they live. It's where their little villages are, right? And it used to be uh, that the woodland realm was ruled over by the Erie dynasties. You heard about them in the video. The Erie dynasties are birds, and they are birds that live in roosts scattered throughout the, the woodland, and they are basically like a, um, they're a little like the Skeksis almost. They're like a small group that used to run the, the woodland, but recently they've come into conflict with uh, the Marquise de Cat, which is a foreign power that has come to the woodland to take it over. Um, at the beginning of the board game, when you set up, the Marquise de Cat has like seized the area and the Marquise has to kind of fight back. Now, there are also, in the base game, there's also the Woodland Alliance, which is essentially the rebel alliance of mice, foxes, and uh, rabbits who are like, we're done with these losers. We don't want the birds around. We don't want the cats around. This is our forest, right? And then the Vagabond, which is who you play in this game. The expansion adds a lizard cult that worships a dragon god and uh, a cabal of uh, money-grubbing otters uh, as well. And I think I saw them in the expansion art. So this will probably cover the core conflict between the um, the cats and the birds, um, but we'll see, we'll see if we expand into the, and there's also an expansion with crows and moles that's underground. It's a whole fucking thing. But anyway, that's the core premise of the board game. And I'm really happy that Magpie chose to focus in on the clear and obvious PC opportunity. These guys, right? Playing vagabonds. You're in a world full of conflict. There is a war going on. There's several factions you can join and get uh, favors from. So obviously the choice for the root tabletop role playing game is that you play vagabonds like that was my first thought and it's really nice to see that that's what magpie wants to do as well so let's 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 take a look at the the quick start so 
we've got what 41 pages 40 pages of uh of art here um the writing team and the art team will be familiar if you're familiar at all with the the designers of uh, any of magpie's games right mark ds truman brendan conway um art direction by marissa kelly uh and then all of the art in the game is by kyle farron who i love to death kyle is a fantastic artist uh kyle did some work for us for dungeon world and uh his his stuff is all over this so get ready to see all kinds of adorable animals doing nasty medieval things to each other <laughs> so in the game, uh, we we are given, uh, in this quick start, we're given some basic stuff about the quick start, an overview of the game, character creation, playing the game, which includes basic weapon, travel, and reputation moves. Page 14 is factions, injury, exhaustion, decay, and morale. Then we talk about gear, and then these are our playbooks for the core game. So the core game, you can be an arbiter, a ranger, a scoundrel, a thief, a tinker, or a vagrant. So your group will be made up of, these are basically your classes. They're the playbooks in this game. Um, there's treasure. Even in a quick start, there's a GMing chapter. Hallelujah. And then we get our map of the woodland and we talk a little bit about war. So it looks like there's going to be some tools to fulfill the stuff that I was curious about, right? To get us to that faction place. And I'm curious to see how it interacts. We're going to talk a little bit about moves and how they work and how they impart information to us. When we get there, we'll talk about Powered by the Apocalypse games in general and how this game might be different or similar to games that, that we want. Because I think I think if you really wanted to make prior to this game coming out, if you really wanted to make a root game, you could just scrape all the fantasy crap off of Dungeon World, throw on some some animal type stuff, and then you just have to do the faction things. And I'm really curious to see what custom bits and pieces come from this and the fact that it's magpie in particular makes me think we're gonna get some fairly decent nuanced mechanics and I'm, I'm saying this almost purely because of masks and how well masks handles telling stories about identity using the powered by the apocalypse system uh so we start with a little bit of fiction which i won't read to you you can download the quick start there's a cool badger there's a raccoon they're running away from some soldiers this gives you a little bit of information about the world, what it's like, and then we get our kind of overview of both the quick start itself and the woodland. And this is this is sort of what I talked to you about. Um, this is what I talked to you about before, about like kind of what is going on in the game. What is the core struggle? What does this game and, and if we want to use Jared's questions, right? What is the game about? How is the game about it? How are we rewarded? What are we rewarded for doing? So let's see what let's see what Magpie says this game is about. In Root, the TTRPG, you all play vagabonds, denizens of the woodland who have been cast out of civilized society, whether by your own volition or by exile. You venture throughout the woodland, fulfilling jobs and tipping the scale in the conflict between the factions. Like, that's, that's how you play the vagabond in the board game, and that's good. That's what we want. The game focuses on fun, adventurous action and escapades on the meaningful, lasting backdrop of the woodland and its war. You'll get into big fights and stage cunning heists, and by doing so, you'll earn reputation with the different woodland factions and perhaps even help them take control over clearings. Sold. So you play freebooters, and there are mechanical ways for you to engage with the faction stuff personally. And that's very cool. Interesting stuff. I like it. So... Fun, adventurous action and escapades. That's that's interesting because I think that there's a thin line, and Mouse Guard does this too. And that's I'm gonna try to keep the like Red Wall and Mouse Guard comparisons down because I think that Root's world is unique in this way. Um, but I'm interested in seeing how we thread that needle, how we walk that line between the grim darkness of war and fun adventurous action and escapades with a meaningful lasting backdrop of war right so we're we're balancing and I, I think that the games obviously the game's art goes a long way um if you saw in that video a lot of the art is very tongue-in-cheek it's a cute animal but they're obviously undergoing like stress of war right that that bunny with the two axes that's a that's a big mood for this game so i'm i'm curious about how the game manages tone and some of that will come from uh from the moves yeah. So, all right. 
let's take a look at uh, what the game has uh, in terms of of mechanical objects, right? So we have vagabonds. Uh, these are your characters. This is who you are playing, right? Most of the time, your life is focused on survival. You are exiles, outcasts, strangers, and oddities, idealists, rebels, criminals, and free thinkers. Those who don't, don't fit into the clearings and the paths who would prefer to live in the spaces between. And that's that's very clever because literally, mechanically, that's what they do. Uh, they have rules to to slip in and out of the the conflict. And if you want to, you could be a bunch of criminals and you just you're war profiteers, right? So you're you're stirring up the war and like doing that stuff. Or you could try to be idealists and heroes and help the rebellion. Um, it's quite cool because I like games that give you op opportunities to engage with the structures of power, but don't necessarily force you to become part of them. That's like typical adventurer stuff, right? Um, so in this game, you create a vagabond. There are six playbooks. You might be the arbiter, a powerful warrior dedicated to what they think is right and just. This is the badger paladin. Uh, a ranger, a uh, rugged denizen at home in the forest and the wild. The scoundrel, a troublemaker, arsonist, and destroyer. A clever and stealthy burglar or pickpocket if you want to play the thief. You can be the tinker, a savvy maker of equipment and machines, or the vagrant, a wandering rabble rouser and trickster who survives on words. So that's pretty cool. Um, so those are our options. Uh, I can already see some tension there. I'm curious to see how the characters are linked to one another because the danger is when you play a group of ne'er-do-wells, right? When it's like, you're all a bunch of potential murder hobos, why would you hang out? Right. If you're solitary entities, why do you spend time together? So I'm, I'm curious to see what the mechanisms of the game say about that, whether there's bonds or history or links or whatever they want to call it. How do we know each other? Because the real problem is that a group like that without those mechanisms will often spiral out in their own direction, which could be difficult if you're trying to keep track of like a larger factional stuff. Uh, so the other player is the, uh, game master with the responsibility to represent the world of the woodland. The GM will portray all the other characters. The GM isn't playing against the other players. They portray the woodland to make it interesting and dynamic. Classic PBTA stuff. I'm looking forward to seeing the principles, the agendas, like that stuff, uh, for, for those characters. So the factions in the game, in this core game, are the two primary ones, right? In the, the quick start game. These two ones, uh, they're the Eerie Dynasties and the Marquisate. Marquisate? Marquisate. Anyway, the cats and the, and the birds. Now, there's a third faction, uh, but it's not in the quick start, right? The Woodland Alliance, which is what we talked about before. The rebellion against both of those. Um, there is one more faction within the woodland, the denizens themselves. Broken up and disunified, um, but it is like the people of the, of the woodland. Uh, in all cases, there's no good or evil necessarily. All the factions do right and wrong. Even if the Marquis de Cat shows up and uh, builds a lumber mill and chops down all the trees, they might also use that lumber to build, uh, you know, homes for the people of the clearing, right? And this is this is the way of, of indicating to the GM, it's your job to portray nuance, not to just be like the evil marching cat empire and the failing chaotic evil bird people, right? It's about creating a, a believable environment uh, where... Kind of ironically, the the animals in this are are humanized in a way that that even some human characters aren't. So this is our our overrun of of kind of what these factions do. This is all fictional stuff. I kind of gave you a, a basic uh, download on that. If you're interested, um, you know, dig in yourself, grab the grab the Kickstarter, the quick start, and take a look at it. I'm here for those mechanics. I'm here for those sick sick mechanics. So let's let's get to them. So when we make our characters, we choose a playbook. Um, they're not the be all and end all. Um, it doesn't look like there's a rule here for uh, you can only have one arbiter and one scoundrel and one tinker. But but maybe maybe they'll maybe that'll be a thing uh, a little a little later down the line. But we'll see. Um, you choose a name, a species and a look. For your character so this is interesting you're not um you're not just Weddlecrest the vagrant and you get a bonus like you're you're whether you're a fox a rabbit a bird whatever it's it's just a blank there's no mechanical choice but i do like that they point out that socially your species influences what people will think of you like if you're playing a bird there may be there may be some kind of like tension between the the eerie 
uh, and your character. It's a way to, to choose. Um, plus, if you're a fox, you might be easily more easily friends with foxes, etc. And then finally, choose your look. And who doesn't who doesn't love this part, right? Who doesn't love picking a woodland animal? Like I, I feel like the best character creation is the one that gets you going already as you're looking at it, right? Where you're like, like I'm already thinking, like, yeah, if I played this, I'd probably be like um, a scoundrel. I'd probably be like a scoundrel who. Uh, you know, is a former member of the Marquis army and uh, who, who fled uh, after a mysterious fire. And uh, I want him to be a, I want to be a bad guy. Can, can I be a duck? Probably. Can you be a squirrel? Sure. Right. Like it's, yeah, it has no mechanical effect, but it's by, by like species grouping uh, how you might interact with uh, the people of the, um, yeah, of the, of the place. So that's cool. Um, the characters in this game, like with many PBTA games, it's 2d6 plus a stat. So the characters in this game have charm, they have cunning, they have finesse, they have luck, and they have might. I do love a game with a luck stat. I do love luck stats. It's like, I just, I really, I really like when a game gives you that option because the GM so, so often, I just want to have a, a move for that or a roll. So we'll see. I want to see what luck is connected to. Um, the rest are pretty safe, uh, safe to, to assume. Charm does what it does. Cunning, it's how smart and clever you are, how capable you are of tricking people. And we'll see these things mean more in the context of moves, right? Stats without moves kind of don't matter in a PBTA game. Uh, it looks like you add plus one to a stat of your choice. You can't raise any stat above two. And you might unlock advancements to uh, max out with three on a very, like on a special move. Okay. All right. So next you have your background, your drive and your nature. Ignore connections for the moment. Okay. This seems familiar. All right. So you answer the background questions to speed up the process. And this is, this is cool. Choose your drives. A vagabond gets two that describe the circumstances under which you advance. Okay. So it's goals, right? Uh, choose a drive based on what you want to do and what you want to see them do. Then choose your nature. It's a deeper personality choice, a way you act to relieve stress. So we're seeing like a little, I'm seeing a little bit of like blades in the dark influence, a little bit of like goals XP in this. So that's cool. So you pick the type of, of vagabond you are. You pick your name, race, name, species, and look. Then you do answer background questions choose two drives, right? Choose your goals for your character, then pick your nature. Then you choose your move. Each playbook has different moves and gets to choose some to define your, your starting place. Um, and then you choose weapon skills. Now that's interesting, right? Weapon move cleave. You have to have the weapon skill yourself and have a weapon tagged with that skill. So obviously fighting is a big deal in this game. I mean, if you look like three of the four vagabonds in this art have crossbows or axes or swords. So that's interesting. Uh, and then when everybody's done with that, we do the bonds thing. We go back. We explain who you are, why you're a vagabond, what your drive is, and you answer any questions that the GM or the other players ask. And then you'll know who the other vagabonds are and you choose your connections. So each player has two connections and gets to use both. Each connection comes with a rules tweak. Read it out loud. Interesting. Okay. All right. So let's let's take a look. This is This is, again, standard apocalypse world stuff this is pbta stuff right roll the dice when a move triggers right the move has a first part when x happens roll with y do z those are the things right so same 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 right this is all familiar stuff 10 plus is a full hit seven to nine is a partial hit six less is a miss the gm never rolls dice nothing nothing revolutionary there which is fine Let's look at the basic moves. So the basic moves of every Powered by the Apocalypse game are the core stuff they want you to do every session. Just constantly doing this stuff. You'll bend and break the rules of these basic moves using your, using your, other, uh, your other moves, your class moves, right? But for now, but for now, we can understand the core stuff of the game. This is the answer to Jared's second question. What is the game about? How is the game about that? Basic moves are the first place to look for that, right? 
So the characters in the root RPG are going to be persuading NPCs, figuring them out, tricking NPCs, reading a tense situation, attempting roguish feats, trusting luck, wrecking things, and helping or interfere. Yeah, trust luck is really interesting. So these games structure the conversation, uh, or these moves structure the conversation of the game. That is the purpose. All Vagabonds have access to this stuff and then additional moves. So let's let's take a look at what that looks like, right? So when you persuade an NPC with promises or threats, roll with charm. On a 10 plus, they see things your way, provided you give them a strong motive or reasonable bribe. Seven to nine, they aren't sure. The GM will tell you what you need to do to sway them. Okay, so this is just like uh, this is just like parlay, right? In in Dungeon World, the idea here and what's important is that you cannot persuade another PC. You can't trick another PC either. This is specifically social manipulation for non-player characters. So that says something about what the game is about. The game is about manipulating NPCs, but not each other, right? So figure someone out, right? This is uh, rolling to, to read a person, right? So you roll with charm. While interacting with them, you spend your hold to find out if they're telling the truth. What do they feel? What do you uh, intend to do? What do you wish I'd do? How could I get your character to blank? This is read a person, right? And once you've read them, if you want to trick them, you roll cunning. On a hit, they do what you want. On a seven to nine, they can hesitate, stumble, or overreact, right? So fairly, fairly standard stuff. Reading a tense situation. Right? We've seen this move used before. It's great. It's useful. Interrogative moves like figure someone out and read a tense situation are to me some of the best moves in Powered by the Apocalypse because they allow you to pause a moment and as players discuss what's going on. Right. I love being able to ask another player or ask the GM what are they actually feeling right now? Or what do they intend to do? I love letting you talk that out on the, the player level. So I'm, I'm actually really happy to see those included here. Um, it also means interacting with NPCs and getting into tense situations is a big part of the game, right? So attempting roguish feats, steal something secure, sneak somewhere, or otherwise slip past security or notice, do rogue shit, Everybody can do it. It's a basic move. Everyone is a rogue, right? That's important. When you trust fate to see you through, roll with luck. On a hit, you scrape by. The GM will tell you what it costs you. On a 10 plus, fortune favors the bold. Your panache earns you an easy escape or fleeting opportunity. So I think trust fate is sort of our stand in for defy danger, if I'm not mistaken. Like it feels to me like trust fate how how will we know right when we trust fate yeah that's just what i'm going to do with every role C could you how do we know that that's the the difference i guess this is where we look at the moves and we make sure that it's we're not making another move right you just trust fate you're like well i'm just going to hold my breath and jump into the river right i like it i think i mean i'm curious to see how it would work are you trusting fate? I feel like would be a question I would have to ask a lot. Yeah, if you're deliberately, you're not deliberately doing anything else. Yeah. Um, so, uh, vagabonds wreck things. So, everybody gets to bend bars and uh, lift gates, right? Roll with might on a hit. You seriously break it. It can't be used again until it's repaired. This, this bit here ties into the board game quite nicely. The idea of vagabond equipment being fixed or not fixed, right? Broken or not broken. That's actually really important. So I'm, I'm curious to see when we get to the weapon and the gear stuff. Um, a hit in this case is any move, uh, any result of seven or better on the dice. Um, a 10 plus is like a solid hit uh, or a red hit in some versions of the game. Um, a full hit in this one. Yeah. Uh, cool. And then help or interfere. You mark exhaustion to add plus one or minus two to their role. Mark exhaustion again to select one of the following. You create an opportunity or obstacle, or you conceal your aid or interference. So this is new. We have something to spend, which is exhaustion. Interesting. Okay. So some notes on the basic moves. I'm not going to read any, really anything from this, this page, but basically this helps us better understand it. I will look at trust fate. 
Let's take a quick pause to look at that. So this move is a backup all purpose move. Always use a more specific one if there is one, but when you do something dangerous, risky, difficult, or tense, and there's no move to cover it, they're probably trusting fate. Remember, any hit at all, seven or higher, there's still a cost. Trusting fate is risky. An easy escape keeps the cost of the move separate from any escape attempt, while a fleeting opportunity is a chance to really stretch, do something dangerous for a great reward. Yeah, so that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. Okay. And then, yeah, help, uh, help or interfere is quite cool. I like the pay to do it. That's interesting. It means that the number of connections you have won't matter, and it frees them up to do something else besides bonds with the connections. So special moves, and this is going to hint at us, uh, a hint to us about the larger world. So we're going to get to learn a little bit about what, what the world has to offer and how we interact with it. So when you travel from clearing to clearing along the established path, the band marks exhaustion to represent how fast and determinedly they move and rolls. If they, as a group, mark fewer exhaustion than the number of vagabonds in the group, I, w I missed the weapons page. Oh, I did. Okay, we'll come back. Yeah, I, I, I double, I double move there. I'll come back and we'll look at that in a second. Anyway, um, if as a group you mark fewer exhaustion than the number of people in the group, minus one, equal plus zero. Each additional exhaustion marked adds plus one. On a hit, you arrive in a timely fashion, largely interrupted and especially fast. On a seven to nine, you encounter something noteworthy on the path, sign of an incident or remains of a fight in the larger war. On a miss, you're embroiled in the middle of a dangerous situation before you arrive. Awesome. So travel in this game is about how fast you want to get from one place to another. When you travel into the forest, which is leaving the, the path, uh, the band marks decay to represent exhausted resources on travel. So decay is a different thing than exhaustion. So if you go into the woods, you decay. Weird. On a hit, you pass into the forest and can make your way to any clearing on the other side. On a 10 plus, the transit is largely safe. On a 79, you run afoul of one of the myriad dangers of the forest. I wonder. I wonder. Chat, what do you think the over-under is on there being rules for using the board from the game as a tool in this game? What do you think the likelihood of that is? Like, go dig out the board game and use it to run this game. You think it's, you think it's 10 to 1, 4? Yeah, I, I would not be surprised at all. Yeah. So, uh, reputation moves. Uh, prestige is a positive word about you. Notoriety is a negative one. Your reputation is the score you have with any given faction representing your over, their overarching opinion and knowledge of you. Uh, when you mark prestige, mark the next open box on the positive side of zero. Oh, so it's like um, uh, uh, paradox. So when you mark enough boxes to reach the next highest number on the track, reputation increases, clear all the prestige. So again, this is pulled from the board game. There is a reputation tracker on the Vagabond sheet. And I'm really excited that they're adapting the mechanisms for playing a Vagabond in the board game to this in what seems like a pretty nice, yeah, it's the rep mechanics in the board game. Very cool, yeah. So you, you move up, and as you, as you cross thresholds, you, uh, you gain reputation with them. And it looks like reputation is a stat between like minus two and plus two. When you mark notoriety, mark the next open box on the left. When you mark enough boxes to reach the next lowest number, clear notoriety uh, and build that up. You track each rep independently. Each PC tracks reputation for themselves independently of the others. In situations where multiple PCs' reputations are at stake, add them together. Interesting. Okay. All right. When you ask for a reasonable favor, roll with rep. Perfect. When you meet with someone important for the first time, roll rep with that faction. On a 10 plus, they've heard only good things and are likely to ally with you. Take plus one ongoing. Interesting. So it's individual or if you are like, well, all right, uh, David, you have the best reputation with the Erie. Go, go and talk to them for us. Be, be our face. Whoever has the highest reputation. That's really cool. Interesting. Okay. All right. So let's go back and look at the weapon moves. So weapon moves cover fighting in battle, especially using equipment. Oh, cool. So it looks like they've broken down something like hack and slash into 
weapon specific moves. Interesting. Okay. So in this case, when you engage an enemy sword to sword at close range, roll with might. When you grapple an enemy, roll with might. When you target someone at far range, roll with finesse. When you throw something to blind an opponent, when you cleave armored foes, when you target an opponent's weapon with your strikes, when you harry a group of enemies, when you make a weapon of improvised material, when you murder a vulnerable NPC, when you parry the attacks of an enemy at close range, quick shot, trick shot, and vicious strike. Crunchier combat. Interesting. So you might be a ranged specialist with trick shot and you use target someone. So you're a finesse fighter. I mean, it's a game about war. So it makes sense that, that this band of freebooters do it. So to use a special weapon move, you have to have both the weapon with the tag and the weapon skill. To use a normal weapon move, you have to have a weapon with the appropriate range. I dig it. I dig it. That's pretty cool. Yeah, slightly crunchier combat. That's cool. It allows you to be it allows you to be similar characters with different propensities uh in a specific type of uh fiction that the game cares about, obviously. I dig it. And then reputation moves. Okay, cool. So Root takes place in the woodland amidst a broader conflict between larger powerful factions. Each one plays a significant role in the woodland and each aims to take control of its own fashion, reshaping the woodland to its needs. So here we go. Okay, the quick start deals with two factions, the Eerie and the Marquisate. Marquisate? I'm never going to get that word right. The full version of the core game deals with the Woodland Alliance. The remaining four factions of the board game, the Riverfolk Trading Company, the Lizard Cult, the Corvid Conspiracy, and the Great Underground Duchy will be in the first supplement. So that's otters, lizards, crows, and moles. In the full game, you have the ability to choose the factions you play with when you start the campaign and add or subtract factions as you go. And then there's always one more faction, just the people that live in this, in this woodland, the common folk. Cool. Every Vagamont has three tracks with four boxes. So it's not just hit points. It's stress and damage, exhaustion, injury, and decay. Exhaustion is your energy, will, and effort. The more boxes you check, the more tired you are. If you check off all the boxes and you can't check another one, you're out. Exhaustion is cleared by one box every day and all boxes if you get rest and care. If you fulfill the condition of your nature, clear all your boxes. Okay, all right. Injury tracks your physical health. The more boxes you check, the more injured you are. Make sense? Decay is your equipment and your vulnerable and its durability. So NPCs have a decay score that works at overall track of their equipment. You so lots of things you could you could lots of boxes you can say, okay, you you take a hit, um, your axe haft snaps. Mark mark decay, right? Interesting. So if a Vagabond has to mark a box of decay and they cannot, I wonder, so the decay is built into specific equipment? Yeah. So you're tracking two. You have your own, essentially your own built in, you have basically your own built in uh, tracker for all of the gears that you, all the gear you have. You're, um, you're a walking bag of adventuring gear. And then... Each piece of equipment marks specific uh, stuff. So your axe might be at two out of three, but your general decay could be at four out of five. Decay clears when you repair equipment or resupply, which is why the tinker matters. Because I bet you the tinker is going to have moves for either bolstering or repairing or both uh, equipment for other characters. And then morale is used by NPCs. It tracks the character's will to keep going in the face of danger. I like it. I'm interested. Okay, let's let's learn the details. So for this uh, for this quick start, everyone starts with assigned equipment. Each piece of equipment comes with tags. We need to mark decay, mark it on the equipment's decay, or the general tag. 
When a vagabond wants a piece of general equipment, mark decay to pull it from their pouch. Fuck yeah, that's really cool. So this means that all of the equipment in the game is just abstracted into, like I said, the class version of gear. And it's kind of, again, kind of like adventuring gear from Dungeon World or uh, abstracted gear um, from uh, Blades in the Dark, but but maybe more. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Okay, good. So if a vagabond wants a new piece of equipment, go through the Tinker and their moves or the Clearing's Denizens. Any piece of equipment should have one to four boxes of decay, one to three tags. The more valuable and well-made, the more boxes of decay and tags it will have. Below is a list of all the playbooks in the Quick Start. You print them on eight and a half by 11. Let's look at the classes. What kind of vagabond would you be? So the Arbiter, you are a vagabond. You have left your home to roam the woodlands. Maybe someday you'll find a new home, but today is not that day. You are the Arbiter, a powerful, obstinate vagabond serving as somewhere between a mercenary and a protector, perhaps taking sides too easily in the greater conflict between the factions. Are you a fox, a mouse, a rabbit, a bird, a badger, or something altogether different? Um, are you a man, a woman, ambiguous, androgynous? Are you large, scarred, well-groomed, old? Do you have faded military insignia? Ooh, I like the idea of a former bird general or something who's like in exile because he decided not to burn down a village that was uh, populated by sympathy uh, to the Woodland Alliance. So you, you had to leave the army and so you have your faded military insignia. You're a, you're like an old bird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're just out there pining for the fjords. Uh, cool. Uh, so there are some questions for your background, right? How did you become a vagabond? Uh, where do you call home? Who did you leave behind? What faction have you served the most? Right? Uh, which faction have you earned a special enmity? And then here are bonds down at the bottom. Uh, the bonds are for this one, the Arbiter. I once protected blank from a mortal blow during a fight and I would do it again. Why? And then the mechanic, and I don't know, let me, let me see if I can let me zoom in. Zoom in on this bad boy. Hang on a second. Let me make that happen for you. There we go. Uh, so if we scroll, let's see, back up before we look at the back of this sheet. Here we go. So down here, whoever you protected, when they are in reach, mark exhaustion to take a blow meant for them. If you do, plus one ongoing to weapon moves for the rest of the scene. Partner. Blank and I helped a faction take control of a clearing and share responsibility for it. You mark two prestige with a faction you helped. Two notoriety with a faction you harmed. If you're spotted together, any prestige or notoriety gains are doubled. So you and this person are, are partners in crime. And I, I really like the idea. Remember when we, we talk about this all the time. Equipment lists are settings. Questions are setting. This is cool. This is setting, right? This is telling us what kind of characters we are playing. We're not nobodies. We are people that the factions are taking notice of. Right? We are we are potentially a big deal. So the back of this character sheet is where all our stats are. The design is like pretty nice. It's fairly like fairly clumped up for one page. Um, I bet you the finished character sheet uh, is going to look pretty different. But yeah, for now, it's pretty text heavy. Yeah, it's hard to do. Um, so here's here's our arbiter. Here are our injury, exhaustion and decay tracks. Right, blank, the arbiter. We choose our nature. Ah, are we a defender? Right, so these are our subclasses. I'm the arbiter. Am I a punisher or a defender? A defender clears their exhaustion track when they defend someone who cannot defend themselves from a dire threat. If you are a punisher, you clear your exhaustion track when you punish a villain for their grievous wrongdoing. Right? Awesome. And also, these would be easy to write new ones if you're a filthy, dirty hacker. Uh, so you write your connections, you choose two weapon skills, and then are you driven to justice, honor, loyalty, or protection? Justice means you advance when you, oh, and this is alignment, right? This is 
Yeah, playbook enforced alignment. So when you advance, you pursue. When you advance, you pursue uh, and achieve justice for someone deeply wronged. Uh, honor, you advance when you up uphold your sense of personal honor at great cost. Oh yeah, and this is two. That's right, you get two of these. Uh, loyalty, name your master to whom you're loyal. Advance when you obey an order at great cost. And then protection, name your ward. Oh, the arbiter is a samurai too. That's cool. I guess if you wanted to play, if you wanted to play like a samurai from far away, you could be an arbiter that's like a Kenku or a Kitsune. Oh my God, you could play a Tanuki. You could be a Tanuki arbiter and you could mark loyalty and honor and you could be from like a forest far away and now you're here working as a, uh, yeah, working as a mercenary. That could be pretty, that could be pretty fun if you want to go that angle, if you want to play that archetype, right? The wandering warrior. That's pretty fun. I like that. Uh, so yeah, you choose your drives and then uh, when you when you do those things, that's how you advance. Um, the Arbiter's moves are brute, so your might goes up by one. Um, oh my God, you could be Usagi Yojimbo. I love it. Uh, you carry a big stick. So when you trust fate to see you through by relying on strength and force, you roll with might. Oh, so you, you trust in might to see you through. That's cool. Um, Crash and smash, so you push your way through scenery to reach someone. Oh, this is the Kool-Aid Man move. Uh, Hardy, take another injury box. Weapon Master, you get the improvised weapon skill. Uh, Guardian, you defend someone or something from an environmental threat. Okay, that's cool. And then uh, as a, as a, you, you get a plate armor and a great sword. And the great sword, you can mark decay to inflict an additional harm. You can mark exhaustion to affect another target within reach. Uh, it is a close. It has cleave and two boxes for decay. And then plate has four boxes and it's arrowproof, cumbersome, and weighty. This is cool. I really like the way that decay and gear works. I like that that's like a box that you can you can mark. Okay, cool. So you can be the Arbiter, uh, you can be the Ranger, a uh, capable, stealthy vagabond centered on the forests that fill the woodland between the clearings, more interested in the wild than company of other woodland denizens. Um, okay, that's cool. Um, by default, the art here is you are a wolf, but you could also be one of the other, the other species. The, um, the connections for the Ranger, uh, I felt betrayed by something blank once did to me. I won't easily trust them ever again. When you figure them out, you can always ask, are you telling the truth, even on a miss? Oh, that's cool. I did something that would have gotten me the enmity of a woodland faction if blank hadn't covered for me. What did I do? Why and how did they protect me? Regardless, I feel indebted to them. When they're in reach, mark exhaustion to take a blow meant for them. Oh, okay, cool. So same, same protector, but for a different reason. That's neat. Okay. And then the ranger uh, is either a loner, clearing exhaustion when you enter a dangerous situation alone, or a cynic, clear the exhaustion when you uncover an important or damaging falsehood. Nice. So the ranger roots out lies or works alone. That's pretty cool. Um, and then you either advance with discovery by investigating a ruin. That's from the board game as well. Uh, freeing a group of denizens from oppression. Naming a foe and getting revenge on them. Naming a ward and taking care of them. Great. Cool. Um, you can get silent pause for stealth. Forager to clear decay when you travel through a forest. Slip away to escape from a fight. Darkened blade to murder someone. See, the game is like, there's these little dark threads that run through it, right? Like, uh, I'm a ranger. And I'm like, I'm a cute fox. I'm gruff and I'm growling at you, but I have this move called Darken Blade that lets me murder you. If your weapon, if your target is unaware of your position, you may murder with weapons tagged for close range instead of just intimate. On a miss, mark exhaustion to remain hidden. Uh, you can threaten people with might instead of charm, or you can be a dirty fighter and pick some stuff. Uh, the ranger starts with Foxfolk Longsword, Longbow, and Chain Armor. 
or you can be my favorite, the Scoundrel, a lucky, dangerous vagabond acting as more as destroyer and troublemaker than anything else, perhaps creating chaos and destruction for its own sake. I think the fox folk are kind of like elfish stand-ins, yeah. Fuck yes, this guy's so good. So, uh, you could be a flea-bitten, overly large coat-wearing, slimy scoundrel, uh, and uh, your uh, your connections are, Blank and I once met and pulled off a mad, impossible stunt. What did we do? Why? Blank and I destroyed a faction's resource on behalf of an opposing faction. Why? Uh, so you can mark two exhaustion to give a plus two to your friend when you help them. And then uh, with partner, mark two prestige with a faction. Oh, so this is that other move, right? We've seen partner before. Um, yeah, scoundrels. Let's see what kind of scoundrel you can be. An arsonist or a combative scoundrel. Arsonist, clear your exhaustion track when you destroy or grievously damage an important structure. Oh my god, I want to play. Okay, here's the thing. I'm going to play a scoundrel. Uh, it's a cat who wears uh, corpse paint. He's a black cat. And he's made, no, no, he's got a um, skull-shaped fur, like white fur in the shape of a skull on his face. Uh, he has a Norwegian accent, and all he wants to do is just, like, burn it all down. I want to play a black metal scoundrel. That's, yes. <laughs> I'm just burning down lizard cult gardens, just running around, like, murdering other, other cats. <laughs> There's actually a Twitter account called Black Metal Cats. Go look it up. It'll be very inspiring for this character. Uh, so the scoundrel can be an arsonist or a combative. You clear your exhaustion track when you survive a fight, win or lose against overwhelming opposition. That's combative. Um, and your drives can be chaos, thrills, crime, and infamy. Cool. Sick. So you could be like a gay crime cat if you wanted to. Um, I like it. I like it. So your moves are arsonist. When you wreck something with flagrantly dangerous means, uh, roll with luck instead of might. Create to destroy. So you just like knock something down uh, and you rig up a dangerous device. It's a distraction. You gain the weapon skill murder. When you murder someone, when you murder someone while they're distracted by environmental danger, roll with luck instead of cunning. So I guess the idea here is if you take arsonist and it's a distraction, you can firebomb someone's house. And then while they're running out, trying to trying to like recover from the flames, you just stab them to death. Yeah. Plus two luck scoundrel that just burns things and kill, kills people while you burn their house down. My goodness. Uh, Daredevil, you're your luckiest when you go into danger without hesitation. Treat yourself as having luck armor with two boxes of decay. Uh, you can have a danger mask, a calling card, a uh, means to obscure your identity. You have reputation minus two with all factions and plus one to trust fate and all scoundrel playbooks. Oh, this is like the faceless. Yeah, 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 totally. And and what this is, and this is that's a great point, Blue Jay. So Blue Jay in, in chat pointed out, God, I get that you were killing warriors and stuff in the game, but it feels more real when you have a move called murder. Yeah, and it's like this is simulating like, what does it look like when the scoundrel comes into a clearing and kills someone with a crossbow and then they don't, they don't get in a fight. Here's the crossbow, right? Mark decay to murder at close range. Mark decay to target at close range. Ignore the enemy's armor. When you inflict an injury, you want to be a cat sniping house burning arsonist maniac. Here's, here's the scoundrel, right? And then better lucky than good. When you use a weapon move, mark exhaustion roll with luck instead of the listed stat. I love it. It's like you just buff your luck as much as you can and then just try to find ways to not roll anything else. The thief uh, is a cunning criminal vagabond capable of stealing even the most well-guarded treasures, perhaps committed to crime and theft for its own sake. So your connections could be that you are a professional. I stole something important, something needed or craved for blank. I proved my worth to them. If you share information with them after reading a tense situation, you both get the plus one. If you help them while they're attempting roguish feats, you gain choices on the help move as if you'd mark two exhaustion uh, instead of marking one. That's pretty cool. Uh, and then blank sprang me to get sprang to get me out of a holding whether they bailed me out or rescued me. I owe them. So, yeah. 
Uh, if you are a thief, you are either a kleptomaniac or you are rebellious. If you're a kleptomaniac, you clear your exhaustion when you selfishly steal something. Perfect. Um, if you're rebellious, you clear your track when you purposely provoke figures of authority into retaliation. What are you gonna do? Stab me? <gasps> oh God! Uh, your drives are freedom, greed, ambition, and thrills. And you get like pretty expected stuff like breaking and entering, disappearing into the dark, uh, evading and dodging your enemies to tire them out. Rope-a-dope is pretty cool. Uh, when you grapple with an enemy larger than you, you can roll finesse if you have small hands. And then you have a nose for gold. What's the most valuable thing you're carrying? Yeah, cool. All right. Uh, and then the tinker is the adept, a clever vagabond interested in mechanisms and craftsmanship. So this is where we're going to interact with some of the like building, rebuilding, fixing, and adjusting mechanisms. So uh, Blank and I have been working together for a while. We read each other's moves easily. Blank and I had each other's back when we were run out of a clearing because our natures got out of hand. The tinker is either, get out of here, vagrant. The tinker is either a perfectionist or a radical, espousing dangerous ideas to the wrong audience or uh, sacrificing others' interest to complete a project or craft. Tinkers are driven by greed, ambition, revenge, or protection. And like the savvy head, they get a workshop. So they can make, they choose a location on the map, they build a workshop, and they use it to, uh, to assemble things. They can also repair equipment to clear decay, uh, as long as they're in their workshop. Um, they can get jury rig, nimble mind, big pockets, and uh, give or take. And their weapon is a smithing hammer. Yeah, that's cool. And then I think Vagrant is our last one. A charming survivor using words to get out of dangerous situations, perhaps even setting possible predators on each other to keep them away from yourself. So if you want to be a fast-talking possum, there is your, there is your person. Um, after, blank, uh, after Blank and I pulled off an impressive heist and stole something very valuable from a powerful faction, my bad choices landed me in dire straits, but they bailed me out. We've been close ever since. So you want to help them fulfill their nature. Or Blink saw through one of my cons and turned it back on me. How? Why did we forgive each other? When you figure them out, you can always tell if they're telling the truth. This is the bard. Yeah, totally. The face. So you're either a drunk or a hustler. <laughs> so you clear your exhaustion when you overindulge on vices like drink, food, and gambling. Or clear your exhaustion when you spring a complicated con on a dangerous mark. Your drives are chaos, thrills, clean pause, or wanderlust. You advance when you obtain something valuable or accomplish a difficult goal without any non-vagabond having any strong evidence of your wrongdoing. That's so good. So you, you mark advancement when you run away, like when nobody catches you. When you're like, well, it's not my fault. Somebody else did it. This is the, the noble, right? Um, your moves, uh, when you're an instigator, uh, you trick NPCs into fighting each other. You can suck up to or butter up unsuspecting NPCs. You can trust fate to see you through by begging, pleading, or abasing yourself with charm. Oh, this is like, um, yeah, this, this is like <laughs> Ramus. Yeah. <laughs> charm offensive, uh, let's play and pocket sand. Take the move blind. <sighs> I like all of these. I'd play, I'd play all of these characters. They all seem like they'd be pretty fun to play. So, of course, during play, you advance and grow. You earn prestige and enmity. Uh, vagabonds advance by following their drive. Each drive lists a condition in which you advance. When you advance by following a drive... Oh, take one of these... Oh, okay. So there's no, there's no, X, there's no um, XP track. You just advance when you topple a tyrannical figure. Interesting. So not a lot of granular... All the goals are hard. Right? There's not a lot of granular advancement. Ultimately, the GM is the judge of whether or not the Vegamon has met the condition, but you should call their attention when you think you've done it. Plus one to your stat, new move from the playbook, new move from another playbook up to two, two new weapon skills, one box to any harm track, two new connections. Oh, so you write your own connections. That's cool. And advancement only happens at dramatic times. It's the Sicarian school of advancement. That's right. Sometimes your nature driver connection will stop making sense. Making sense. You can change them. 
An arbiter breaks with their master. A thief sways towards radicalism. Friendship cools and becomes professional. Changing these is not a matter of advancement, but important to change the reflection of the fiction. At the end of any session, change one drive, nature, or connection. Whatever you choose, replace with a new version from any of the playbooks. Well, that's cool. That's a nice little note. So you have to play one of two, but when you're done being an arsonist, your scoundrel can become anything. So you could be like, I'm a scoundrel, but I'm not an arsonist anymore. Now I'm a radical. Interesting. And it's specifically one from the other playbooks. That's really fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very cool. Love it. I'm into it. That's very cool. So, treasure. Uh, many vagabonds focus on filling their pouches with hard-earned hard -earned coin. The woodland has no single currency. Denizens tend to barter and trade. Um, so this is our this is our equipment, uh, our equipment uh, chapter. We have tags for the weapons uh, and the gear, to be expected. Uh, and that's that's normal. That's good. They just give us one page. You're supposed to make up your own stuff using these. Um, I love that there's different kinds of weapon, right? Like, you have a sword, but it's not just a sword. It's a sword of fox folk steel, right? It's a sword of mouse folk steel. It's a sword of rabbit folk steel, and they all do different stuff. That is fucking cool. And you'd notice, right? You'd be like, I'm really proud. I only wield rabbit folk swords, right? They're the best, because I can use my finesse instead of might, right? The blade is light and thin. Like, I think, I think that's just so cool. It's so, so fucking flavorful. That's a really good tag. All right. How do we run this fucking game? It's one thing to learn about the rules, but it's another to see the rules of the game directly pointed at us. How do we, as game masters, run this game? What is our agenda? This is my favorite thing about Powered by the Apocalypse. The, the formalizing of specific things that you have to do to GM this. I love it. Thank you. Give it to me. So, our agendas. What do we do in this game? We make the woodland seem large, alive, and real. We make the vagabonds' lives adventurous and important. And so, so I think, I think Dealer Umbra noticed this in chat earlier. That point, Umbra, that you made about it seems like the vagabonds are supposed to be important. Good eye. Excellent design sense. That is indeed the point. And then play to find out what happens, which we should all be doing all the time anyway. Um, our principles are, are many. Um, be, the fan, be a fan of the vagabond. Address the characters. Describe the world like a living painting. That's fucking cool. And it just goes to show, like, Kyle, Kyle Farron, my good man, I don't know if you're watching this or, or if this makes its way to you, but that, as a, as a game designer... That is a huge, huge, like, stake in the ground. Like, obviously, the art is incredibly important to, to Root. It's a huge part of why it's successful. But this is the mechanism saying, describe your game like Kyle painted it. That's a huge vote of confidence. I love that. And, and it's a way for me to understand, like, if I were to paint this as a vignette in Kyle's, like, particular style, how would I describe it, right? If I commissioned... The artist of Root to, to make this, what would it look like? What would that commission description look like? That's very cool, right? Um, none of these really jump out as, as like different from base Apocalypse World stuff, except for remind them of their outcast status. That's quite cool. Where it's like, all right, we're heroes. We saved the town. But like the town, the clearing will never truly love you the way you want to be loved. Because you are an outcast, right? Remind them of that. Remind them they don't fully belong. That's quite cool. That's a, that's a good one. Um, and I like this. When you get stuck, give them a carrot or a stick, right? They're vagabonds. They're out there to do things. Show the faction's fangs, right? Make, the, make a hard move with the faction. Target their reputation. Right? If they want to look like good guys, threaten them. If they don't mind looking like criminals, threaten that with someone who looks up to them. That's brilliant, right? So here's how we figure out NPCs. NPCs have a name, a description, a job, and a drive. So it might be Dugan 
the Blue Jay who wants to get rich, right? It could be uh, Wanda, the owl, who wants to survive at all costs. That's pretty good. Three things about an NPC. Their name, their species, and their drive. And I, I think that what I love about games, this is the one thing I love about games that use anthropomorphism, and if they use it well, this is a real good, strong approach. When I say to you, he is like a rabbit, immediately you start understanding what that is. You, you can immediately say, oh, he's probably kind of jumpy, um, easily scared, right? He, prob he probably fucks. <laughs> I'll take deal, dealer number. I'll take that one. But like we can do this. I played to, to draw a quick like actual play analogy. I played a LARP called the tribunal and in the tribunal, everyone, it's a 12 player military LARP. you you play military, human military officers, but instead of giving you characters, they just give you names. So they say, you are Sergeant rat. You are private horse. You are private crow. And so what you have to do is derive your character's personality and behaviors from the animal. So immediately by saying that someone is, for example, a magpie, <laughs> you know things about them, right? They're going to be distracted by flashy stuff. It's going to be, you, you understand something about them by anthropomorphizing their animal qualities, which is why species is so important, right? We're going to make some assumptions and then you can either go in on them or you can flip them, right? Like if somebody is a mouse, the players are going to expect them to behave like one and you can flip that and be like, actually, they're really, they're really bold and brave, right? This, this particular character is, uh, yeah, aggressive and angry, right? It's great. It's a really cool way to, to bring some character to that. <gasps> Look. It's the map. So this is the this is the map from the board. This is uh the map from the board game. Uh it looks like it's a little zoomed out, which is cool. We get a little bit of extra like edge territory here. These are clearings. Right? Clearings, clearings. These are the roads between them. And then I guess probably what we end up doing is like naming the clearings and building the world. Oh my god, random tables. Random tables. So when you start a game of Root, you need a map of your version. Use a pre-existing map like the board game itself or create a new one. The map will always have 12 total clearings. Faction shit. This is what I wanted. Here we go. This is the, this is the hot shit right here. So the board game itself is going to end up with three maps. There's going to be the fall map, the winter map, and there's like an underground map, I think, coming in the expansion. But obviously, these, these they'll be hopefully they'll provide us with those versions and a bunch of other like alternate maps. We can also draw our own if we want. So 12 total clearings, but there's also a lake map coming up. Perfect. So 12 total clearings. If you're using a pre-existing map, you're set. Skip to control of clearings. If you're making a new map, read on. Take a blank sheet of paper, draw a circle, draw a number of lines equal to its number of Oh my God, that's so cool. So this is literally drawing the, so, okay, here, I'll, I'll make a promise right now. When the game comes out and we have a finished version of the game, we'll do like a, a, either a prep stream for a real game or I'll do like a fake prep stream and we'll like make a character and we'll build, uh, we'll build a woodland because I'm really interested in seeing how, how this works. Um, and every time that I've ever played, every time I've ever played Root, I'm like, I wish, I wish we had a name for these places and so they've given us some open sky haven flat home limbery oakenhold black paws dam yeah i'm feeling it oh my god that's so cool so you draw your circle you get three for dominant community so it's a mouse community called sundell uh a seven for number of paths and a two plus six for name the new clearing is a mouse community with three paths in the name of sundell Next, I draw my next clearing and roll. I got a four for dominant community, five for number of paths. And so eventually you just keep connecting them until we get to, until we get to uh, having a map. That's very cool. So there's our, there's our setting. And then between all of this is forest and that's our woodland. This is such a cool mini game. 
So first, choose a corner of the woodland. This is the role playing game version of the setup of the board game. I'm blown away. This is really, really cool. So choose a corner of the woodland. If you want to determine randomly, roll a d6. The corner is the Marquise de Cat stronghold. She runs her occupation of the woodland. The Marquisate is in control of that clearing. The opposite corner is the Erie Dynasty. Then you start filling out the rest with roosts, buildings. You're building the setting, but it's, it's again, giving you these tools to create it. Oh, that's so cool. And then I guess the, the, the supplements will update these tables with the other factions. And then you decide a dominant population that clearing faction with the least neighboring controlled clearings faction with the most controlled clearings to create the, the tension in this, this faction turn procedurally generating your world. Cool. If you want additional detail, roll on these tables, random tables are setting. It's so cool. So what is the notable feature of this place? Who are two important inhabitants? And you don't even need to roll these in advance. You just roll them when you get there. You're like, welcome to Chunksburg. Uh, the important inhabitants of this town are an astronomer and Mayor Chunks. Uh, Mayor Chunks spends most of his time in the brewery, but there's also a beautiful town hall built 40 years ago by the, the cats when they came here. Uh, and then problems this is your game. This is your whole game. And this is setting, right? This is maybe the most important setting piece of the whole game because these are the things. They're not just problems. They're what are the characters in this game going to do? If you go to a town, it's like dogs in the vineyard. You could be, you could literally play this game just like dogs. Wander from clearing to clearing, solving problems and getting in trouble, right? Yojimbo. Dogs in the Vineyard, Mouse Guard, these episodic moving from place to place, getting involved in other people's problems fiction. It's great. I love it. And, and it's, it's perfect for this kind of play. So you can randomly generate the initial situation for a one shot or the start of a campaign by rolling on these tables. Figure out where they were sent, what they're there to do, who hired them, what the target is. This is that Blades in the Dark shit, right? So they were sent to one of these clearings. They were sent to do something specific. They were hired by someone and here is the target. And you, you can just do this every single time they go to a new clearing. You could run a campaign of this episodically where every two episodes, it's just like, all right, well, we're rolling on. Cue the, cue the end credits theme. And then they wander into the next area. Yeah, just totally improvise everything about every place right before you start controlled chaos. Oh, it's so good. I love it. There's a threat in this town. It's a heretical philosopher and a secretive murderer. Like, yes, the game is cute, but look at these threats. Callous mercenaries. I mean, honestly, you could steal these tables for any like setting in which there is, there is chaos, but yeah, I'd love to do a one shot of this. I <laughs> do one with Elspeth, Vanna, Zeke and Dodger. I think Dodger would like this game. Yeah, we'll take a quick look at the Kickstarter when we're done and see when it's meant to be out. But I bet you I could do a role play one shot with this without too much trouble. Yeah, that'd be fun. Uh, anyhow. A game of, of Roots starts after the War for the Woodland begins. To determine how a clearing has been impacted by the war upon encountering it, 2d6 plus each faction either controlling or neighboring the clearing. Oh, cool. So when you leave and you come back, the clearing might be battle scarred or occupied or fortified now. Oh, that's baller. That's very cool, right? Change in the, in the universe. Uh, sometimes during play, the GM will take time skips forward. This is how the faction stuff works for time moving forward. That's so cool. And that's it. That's our, that's our quick start. Even with the quick start, you could get a fair bit out of this. And it's a good, I got to hand it. Mark, Mark and company, you did a fine job making me want more. You made me want more of this game. Um, 
I want to see the other factions. I want to, I want more, more options. I want to see what like the other vagabonds are like. Yeah, I love it. And I, I love, I love how deeply connected to the game's art and the game's core premises that this is. I think they've done a really, really good job with that. I'm pretty impressed. Let's, let's take a, a real quick look. Cause I'm, I'm actually interested just for myself. The educational part of the first look is over. Now I just want to see. I just want to see how. I want to see what I can get. <laughs> give me, give me these things. So it looks like it's delivering. What do we say? September of next year. It's like a year from now. Yeah. September 2020. Okay. All right. So. You can get the, the quick start you can download right now. Um, if you do, uh, maybe use my drive through link down below. Uh, you can, you can download the quick start right now. Uh, and that's, that's fine. Uh, that's what we just looked through. So you can get a start there. You can start playing today. And then the game itself. What do we get? What do we get if we buy this? Give me the good shit. Aha, here we go. Okay. So digital books for the Root tabletop role-playing game and Root Travelers and Outsiders come in PDF form, distributed through drive through There is a core book for all the core rules of the game, the three main factions, the procedural map, and then additional tables. I mean, this is nice. I'm going to get, I'm going to probably get a hard copy of these. Uh, here's our expansion. Look, otters and moles and lizards. And look at that crow. So six new vagabonds. Oh, ho, ho. the adventurer, the champion, the chronicler, the envoy, the harrier, and the raider. Four new factions, more weapon moves, map mechanics, and woodland details. And then there's like fancy deluxe versions. And then the vagabond satchel, with come, which comes with dice, equipment cards, and maps. Well, shit. That looks great. This seems really cool. Uh, and then they've got a bunch of uh, they've got a bunch of uh, goals they're working on uh, clearing, and it looks like they're doing a great job uh, on day, what day one here. Um, let's see. So the goals so far are a fully fleshed out, ready to use campaign setting, right, with NPCs, problems, secrets, and rewards. Hook foot bog uh, clearing built on a swampy marsh. Okay. All right. Um, Six Claws Stand, so another fleshed out clearing. The Swampland Map, okay. Uh, new Dice in Eerie Blue, featuring the regal face of a Blue Jay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Limery Post Digital Clearing, so another another clearing. That's cool that they're just adding in like additional like fleshed out settings. And then a new Redwood Map at 80K, which like honestly, we're just, they're going to hit that like if they haven't already. Um, cool. And then you can get like additional, additional stuff. Well, all right. That seems cool. Uh, and it looks like there are a couple of actual play shows that are already using this. And I think, I think I've seen this legend of Avantris one. So if you want to see people playing the game, uh, legend of Avantris, uh, shout out to them. They are playing the game. And then very random encounters has a, uh, a podcast. Fricking sick. So cool. So, uh, yeah, please, if you're, if you're interested in it, uh, go ahead and go ahead and check it out. Go to bit.ly slash root first look, uh, go have a look at it. If it seems cool, honestly, while you're waiting for the Kickstarter to fulfill, play the board game because the board game is so, so good for me. What I, what I would ideally like is to be able to play Play the board game with a bunch of people, get them bought in, and then be like, so you like playing the Vagabond? Let's let's play the RPG. Um, I think this is a great choice. And I've said this before, and I'll continue to say it for all of time. Making licensed games is so freaking hard. It is incredibly challenging to capture the spirit of a TV show, a board game, a movie, whatever in role-playing game form because role-playing games are so broad and so open and it's really cool seeing that that um mark and the folks at magpie have an understanding of the game uh, and are working so closely with uh, uh leader games to make this game uh, i will say this if you like 
if you like the art, uh, if you like the art, uh, Kyle is working on a new game. Uh, he has started teasing some art for that. It looks really cool. Um, and uh, he has said that in this game, there's going to be new root art that has never been seen anywhere before. So, yeah, that's also really cool. Um, so go and check. Uh, go check out the team. Um, I think what is Kyle's Twitter? It's D20 plus modifier, I think. Let me double check. Yes. Yeah. Kyle is D20 plus modifier. Uh, all spelled out, uh, D, the number 20, and then the words plus modifier. Uh, and um, yeah, go and go and support artists. Go check that out. Kyle's work is fantastic. Uh, there is going to be all kinds of good stuff coming out. This Kickstarter just started today. Keep an eye on it uh, if you're interested. And, and at the very least, go and check out the, the quick start rules. Seems like a cool game. Um, I'm excited. I'm excited to play this. I'm going to start looking for an opportunity. We'll see it. We'll see in. We'll see in a year, right? And in the meantime, go check the game out yourself. Thank you for coming to this uh, an RPG first look at the Root role playing game. Uh, thank you, Magpie, for uh, making this possible. Definitely, uh, definitely happy to do it. And uh, hopefully, some some folks have found uh, a new game to play as a result. So we'll see you next time. Uh, I'm working on a few just for, for uh, awareness sake. I'm working on a few more uh, first looks uh, right now. Um, you know, still trying to get together the Pathfinder uh, second edition first look. Uh, also working on a first look for Casketland. Uh, and uh, there is a pending first look at uh, Aegon, uh, John Harper, and Sean Nittner's second edition of John's extremely badass ancient Greece role-playing game. So keep an eye out for those more first looks. They're going to be in the events page uh, on my Twitch uh, when I have them scheduled. So yeah, thanks for coming everybody. We will see you next time. Have a good one. I don't know. Don't let a raccoon burn your house down.